I want to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in this week um, to our, our latest uh, February meeting of the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. This has uh, obviously been a little bit of unorthodox times having had our rescheduled meeting last week, but uh, I thank you everyone for, for coming in. Um, we have a very special guest, uh, a, a, a friend of mine for uh, quite some time, uh, Andrew Rodney, who is a filmmaker, um, who has, uh, I, I think has a very interesting perspective on a lot of the issues that we deal with in the governance program. And so um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. I will, uh, for those who have not seen uh, the film that we'll be discussing today, Unrepresented, uh, I'm going to put the link into the chat window and uh, feel free to, uh, Andrew has been gracious enough to allow everyone to uh, watch the film for the next uh, day or two if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and uh, I strongly, strongly recommend it. It's uh, just under an hour. It will be airing on PBS uh, this, um, uh, I guess, the entire year, if I if I'm correct. And so uh, it's uh, pretty pretty great, I think, to have your have your work pay off in that way. But um, but yeah, so I, I think you know maybe we'll uh, uh, start off, Andrew, if you want to just uh, introduce yourself a little bit, and uh, and I think. Um, maybe explain the thesis to our viewers of of the movie and 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 you know what you hope to accomplish by by making it. Okay, well, thank you, John, for having me, and thanks to our street and everybody who's who's attending it. Uh, Unrepresented uh, was a project that I started back in 2017. I have a friend who's the director of the film, uh, and that's why I I get into filmmaking. I'm I'm a full time uh, Vice President of Operations at a family plastics company in the Detroit area, and uh, I films are you know I, I get involved in in trying to make a, a difference in various areas, and and after a while of working, as I'm sure you've all experienced, you find that there's kind of a dearth of knowledge about uh, the underlying issues. So, getting involved in making this film or um, another film that this director and I made was really just an attempt to improve understanding uh, of the issues that we cover. And those issues are, you know, we, we try to boil the, the, the thesis of the film uh, is essentially that we, we have a number of element, uh, corrupting elements uh, at work in our uh, political system currently. And um, some people are more focused on one than another, but they're all kind of working together. And, and those three elements are um, the, the ways that um, campaigns are, uh, political campaigns are financed, um, the way that lobbying occurs. And, and then those are both mechanisms for influence buying. Um, and then the payoff to those is assured by our government's uh, limitless debt spending. And, and that those three things acting together um, result in the American people uh, being uh, not lacking the, the adequate checks and, and involvement in, in government. And, and so that's, yes, that's it. We call it, we call it the corruption cycle that these, these three things act together. And, and that's the premise and, and we're trying to you know, the, the film will be on PBS, but we're, we make a lot of focus on trying to get this in front of uh, college students and high school students. And, and the film was made in a very nonpartisan uh, way, if you haven't seen it, where uh, it, it takes this approach of talking about the corruption cycle to, to have an even handed a, approach to these issues uh, to make people realize it's not just one, you, you shouldn't just focus on one matter, you should focus on, on um, several matters and, and try and build coalitions to, to help you to get at the issue that might be the biggest one to you. So. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think it's a very interesting perspective. I mean, obviously, as someone who is, uh, you know, would maybe describe himself as center right, I think there's a, a lot of, um, one of the things that, that struck me is that there's a lot of lessons and, and ideas that you pulled from across the political spectrum. I think that you know, sometimes I think much to our frustration, there's sort of this this argument that or, or belief that I think a lot of people have that that, um, you know, wisdom is only contained on one side of the political spectrum, but that's very often not the case. And so I wonder if you might um, maybe explain to those who are uh, listening, you know, what are the ideas or what are the things that you think that 
you know, the left gets right in this space that maybe the right doesn't understand or doesn't doesn't agree with and, um, and, and vice versa, you know, what are the what are the ideas what are the concepts that you think that um, the right understands about this process and, and all of these issues that we're talking about um, that, you know, maybe the left overlooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, speaking those general terms, you know, sometimes I hate using the right left, um, you know, framework because it, it leaves so much out but but using those those terms I think that what where I started with the film uh, what what the left tends to get wrong um, is, is kind of where I started with the film in and we were very focused on on debt the, the story at the beginning was very largely uh, focused at trying to reveal the extent to which debt was kind of corrupting and and you know, breaking um, our, our political system and, and leading to all manner of, of problems um, that, that a lot of people don't associate. Unfortunately, you and, you and I, John, have discussed at length, but um, Republicans and, and people that are debt, considered debt hawks frequently talk about this topic, uh, the topic of debt, as though it's, this, it's, it's only a long-term problem, that it, it's, it's about what it's going to do to our grandchildren and, and, and you know, the future of, of having to pay this off, rather than focusing on the fact that it's allowing us to avoid um, really having debate. It's, it's, it's allowing Congress to avoid um, really evaluating what the American people value, what they, what they want to finance, what they believe in uh, today. And it's also allowing a lot of money um, to go out the door to a lot of interest groups uh, that, that you know, wouldn't, wouldn't happen if you had to pay for it with taxes because of the extra scrutiny that they would receive. So. So the film started on that, and I think that that the left really misses that um, topic in general. They, you know, debt is is seen because, and in part it is because Republicans have for so long talked about debt as this huge problem. Only when they take power uh, to to just spend more debt than any um, other administrations, um, you know, that with with some exception. Um, in, in the last 50 years. So, so it's kind of just, it, it strikes everybody as a falsehood. It's, it's a Republican issue and then, and then they just throw it out the window. So why, would they, why should they pay attention to, to debt spending um, as an issue? Um, so that, that I think would be the principal issue that they get wrong. And then, and then they also get wrong in the diagnosis of how to fix it. You know, as, as we don't, I don't think we show in the film, but um, the, you know, a lot of, uh, more left and liberal interests tend to decry that you know there's 14 billion dollars that we know to have been spent on the election campaigns in in 20 in 2020 cycle, uh, but when you look at how much spending occurred in fiscal 2019 2020, that 14 billion dollars was 0.1 percent. So focusing on you know the need to come up with all these new uh, and enhanced regulations on how people are going to, you know, buy or, you know, how they're going to influence policy when the rewards of doing so are in the billions of dollars to individual interests um, is, is flawed. Uh, Amazon made, you know, was awarded a $10 billion contract in 2019. Um, you know, they compared to their spending again, it's like 0.1% of what they spent on the, on the election cycle in 2020. There, there's, there's always, so long as the spending is unchecked at the top, there's always going to be that incentive to influence. And the same with lobbying. There's always going to be that incentive to influence as long as debt exists. Um, now that's issues on the left. Go to the right and say where, where people get it wrong on the right. I'd say, as I already said, focusing on debt as though it's some future issue and not focusing it out as a present problem um, and how it's breaking things is is one issue I would say that you still get a lot of Republicans who talk about it that way when they should be you know the way people the way the general public you know thinks um, future issues are future issues that you know they want to deal with what is present today so even talking about it as a future issue just gives somebody an excuse to not think about it because there's starving people in the streets right now so why should we do do worry about you know what our grandchildren are going to have to deal with um, that's one issue I would say that the main problem I ran into in, in with Republicans um, in, in making this film or where I, I found that they were, um, there's a blind spots or, or you know, it, it was that there, there tends to be a, a willingness to, to accept um, 
broken systems that benefit them. So, you know, gerrymandering would be one such process where you, you know, during the timing of this film, you know, Michigan went through and, and while well, if that's not a campaign finance issue, I'd say it, it, it's evidence, evidentiary of, it, we do talk about it in the film and it, and it evidences um, a similar attitude towards, you know, our, our, our broken campaign finance system that, so when, when this film was going on, gerrymandering, a gerrymandering referendum was on the ballot in Michigan and Republicans, you know, just kind of quietly opposed it. They didn't really go out there and say, you know, I mean, it, some, some would go out there and say it, but in general, it was just, hey, this isn't, you know, they, they would say that this was the wrong reform. They would never say, hey, we're going to advance the right reform to gerrymandering because everybody thinks that's fair. They would just say, this is the wrong reform and oppose it if they would even do so. And then almost a lot of times it was quiet. And similar with our campaign finance system, it's, you know, Citizens United um, kind of, which was also a documentary about Hillary Clinton um, that, that was funded, that was financed. And, and I don't have a problem with the, the outcome. People should be able to make documentaries, uh, but it, it, it's that opinion became an end around of allowing individuals to spend as much as they wanted without clear disclosure. And and that, it, or it allowed that. And, and that's an area, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a tricky matter, but I think, but Republicans are fine to kind of not see the issue reformed so long as it benefits them where, you know, a more, in my belief, you know, I mean, it's something like abolishing PACs in general and just requiring um, elections be, you know, uh, that it be citizen direct contributions mm -hmm. is a is a sensible reform, but you're not going to see that advance. You're just going to see kind of holding the line on what is um, a flawed uh, a flawed system that we have. So it's it's not a lot of times it's not viewpoints that I feel that Republicans are wrong on. It's how they govern. It's it's willingness to continue with the status quo um, that's broken and defend that rather than advancing their own reforms for a variety of issues that we cover in the film. Another one, just real quickly, would be, um, let's see, like HR1, you know, if, if people know what that is, you know, the Democrats uh, or whatever, and Congress's first resolution, which covers a range of um, election-oriented reforms, has in it that, you know, members of Congress shouldn't be allowed to raise a fundraiser in session. And uh, now HR1 is loaded with a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't support, but that would be one that should just be that I think the broad majority of people support, and it should just be taken out and passed by itself. But I don't see Republicans, you know, like doing. There will be some, but in in general, you know, Mitch McConnell is not going to support um, that that be done. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there are a lot of things to to respond to there. Um, you know, one is that. Uh, I think your point, your initial point about spending and sort of the way that it impacts the system uh, is, a, is a missed point, and it's something that is rarely talked about. I mean, I think that the issue of government, government finances tends to be one that is, um, you know, as you said, you know, Republicans talk about it, they don't necessarily do anything about it, and, and, and Democrats, you know, if we're sort of painting in these broad strokes, maybe, you know, don't don't really talk about it, but that actually, um, they're, you know, they're setting aside the question of whether you want government to do certain things and setting aside the question of whether or not it's affordable for government to do certain things. There is this whole other component that it, it you know, it lubricates this sort of system in a way that may not actually be healthy by, you know, essentially removing trade-offs um, and allowing allowing everyone to get, um, you know, to advance interests that, that it may not, uh, may not be the best for American citizens. Uh, and so I think it's an interesting argument that um, frankly should have appeal across the political aisle that even if you even if you want um, you know if you want uh, you know really big government or you want really small government, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, um, you should really think long and hard about the implications for uh, you know for advancing priorities when um, you know you have you have this sort of, um, you know, I guess we can use the word corruption that's sort of in, in some degree enabled by, um, 
by the fact that that everything kind of flows through through Washington and, and, and you know and, and as Washington grows in size it creates the ability to um, I don't know to increase that corruption over time maybe not necessarily as an intended consequence but very much an unintended consequence um, I, I want to talk a little bit we'll, we'll certainly talk about HR1 um, you know I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question about um, this whole idea of rigging, you know, that we, we've heard, I mean, this has been something that has uh, been talked about very much in recent years, obviously, you know, because of former President Trump talking about, um, you know, the idea that, that uh, you know, government is rigged or that broadly speaking, the system is rigged. And I wonder if you, um, after having made this film, if you, if you buy into that, you know, do you, do you think that this is, in, in your view, is, are these problems that have been sort of designed in this way? Um, or are they, are they, you know, uh, it has the system as it currently exists, um, sort of developed, you know, in us in an evolutionary sense, but not necessarily through sort of, you know, a conscious attempt at designing it this way. And I guess the related question to that is that, you know, if you do think that there is some level of, of you know, rigging, um, is it, is it in the way that, you know, politicians, you know, talk about it or have talked about it recently? Or is it, you know, to what degree do you think that the way that we've had this, this conversation um, is accurate or, or, is, or is inaccurate? Yes, uh, I, I do believe that, you know, I do believe that things are rigged. I mean, when you look at former Representative Amash talking about what we all know, uh, which is that to get a particular committee spot uh, or to become the speaker, you have to raise X amount of money. And that's just known, you know, that, that you have to do that. To be, they, there's, you know, the DCCC um, and, other, and the Republicans as well, the, the conference sets fundraising goals and, and the whole system is designed, and when I say the whole system, but with that being stated, if, if you have to raise a certain amount of money to gain control over a committee, then you right there are told, you know what I mean? And you have influence over that industry, then there's a price tag that's placed on uh, in the system. I mean, and, and I think in terms of why it developed this way, it's very, very complicated and it goes back, um, you know, decade, I mean, it go, go back to it forever if you'd like, but, but uh, back to the constitution if you'd like. But I, I think that what happened post-World War II is, is just something that you could, you could make a eight part, 10 part, you know, uh, two hour per chapter uh, documentary about the post-war United States government and, and all of the evolutions that we saw from going from this, I mean, smaller, you know, the 2% of the uh, GDP government at the turn of the century to, you know, where we're at now, 45% of the spending and, and just how through, you know, the wars, Roosevelt, um, and then especially in that, in that post-war period where the U.S. just had so much unlimited power, um, the reserve currency that we, that we still have, um, and cultural power, just, just the decisions that were made over those decades that have cumulatively um, caused the problems that that we're, we're still we're still dealing with today. You know, it's kind of a just just some of some of the problems were just things we didn't deal with carefully enough um, back in the '70s and '80s. So, I, but I do I, in terms of inaccuracies, in terms of the rigging, certainly uh, the, the inaccuracy I would I would principally see is that. Um, the, the degree to which people who talk about the rigging um, will directly point at the boogeymen of the, you know, the Charles Koch and the George Soros uh, of the system, where it's, you know, they, they say, you know, that it's these, these guys, you know, you, you can't receive a, an email from some organizations or senators without referencing, um, you know, boogeymen like this. But the reality is that the most financing that's coming isn't coming from those people, it's coming from, you know, Boeing and GE who want to preserve um, the, 
what is the bank forgetting you know what i mean like the the, the banks that allows them to make loans the to yeah. it's excellent bank you know what i mean like it's you know I, I remember a friend who worked that we both know who worked at um one of charles Koch's uh, agencies and when the xm import bank um was defeated briefly um it it they i think they spent five million dollars and then you know I don't know if it was a year later uh, or less, but you know, GE and Boeing spent $60 million on, on resurrecting the, the XM bank. And it's the same with pharmaceutical companies, or, I mean, if you just look at where the spending is coming from, it's people who are get, it's, you know, it's the black rocks that give money to both parties just so that they have a seat at that table. Uh, and they don't really care about what the representative is doing and, other areas they just care about their particular area um and and so it's it's all they're they're kind of indifferent they're just very very focused on their own thing so i think that the most money is what i'm saying is that most of the money is coming in there and most of the influence that i see is is coming through through and i mean it's it's more of indifference to what what happens than it is a targeted you know agenda of the right or left to accomplish you know, these things, the Green New Deal, you know, that proposed Green New Deal that, you know, would, has been talked about. I mean, that would surely be uh, what, if anything gets done, what I would expect it to be. Um, again, there'd be a range of things, but you know, what's going to be in there is going to be um, tons of give outs to, to interests that have been friendly to Democrats for, for decades. And, 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 you know, I, my girlfriend works for a a prominent consultancy um, that deals with both environmental and um, the issues of, you know, mitigation and resiliency for communities. And through that, I just get to watch just these floods of, you know, I mean, like money that most people don't ever see um, going towards these, you know, all these different things that you don't, you don't see. There's just, there's just an entire structure out there that most people are completely ignorant of where the government is passing money uh, through to different entities and organizations. So I do believe it is rigged. It's just not rigged, I think, in the way that most people see it, where they see it as a little more agenda driven, when in reality, it's just a cash grab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think, it's a good point. I, um, I, I wonder, though, whether what we're seeing is really um, a symptom rather than an underlying problem. I mean, you know, there, there are people, I think, on both sides of the political aisle who talk a lot about money and politics, um, but there are a lot of, you know, when you, when you talk about that issue, there are a lot of very complicating factors. I mean, one is that, you know, uh, there's just value in, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's sort of a free speech issue, right? I mean, it's your, it's your capital and you have the ability to, to, to spend it, um, and to get your voice to be heard. And, you know, I think that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, not everyone has necessarily the best un you know, uh, selfless or unself-interested, um, you know, reason for doing so, which I know you, you address in, in the, in the film, but I wonder, you know, I wonder if that's really the problem. I mean, and I and I also wonder, um, even if it is a problem, whether or not it's one that is becoming less important. I mean, one of the things that we've seen in, in recent election cycles is, you know, what I think many people have called the democratization of the funding of campaigns, where, you know, you see, um, you know, maybe AOC or Bernie Sanders or, or previously, you know, Barack Obama on the left, or you see, um, I don't know, a Ron Paul on the right or someone like that, who, um, you know, is able to attract contributions from a wider, more, um, you know, decentralized donor base, such that, you know, the, the I mean, that's obviously not true of all members. Um, but, but it's sort of, uh, you know, to some degree, I think we're seeing this change occurring where to be truly impactful. Um, and, and, you know, and maybe it requires both, it may require the sort of, you know, the, the funding from some of these more, uh, you know, special interest oriented uh, sectors. But I, I, I wonder, um, do you think that that assessment is right? Do you think that this is on some level becoming less of a problem um, and maybe not even really the root of the problem itself so much as just a broader symptom of other things like, you know, members who don't necessarily care about policy, for example, or an electoral process that encourages people um, to run and, and to win who, who ultimately don't you know, are there for reasons other than, um, you know, doing the proverbial right thing. Yeah, I, 
we're in agreement that you know the campaign finance system is not the root of the evil. Um, it is a reflection on, uh, again, I, like I said, it, you're going to have this much spending when there is what there is at stake. Um, and, and in the lobbying as well, um, you're going to have the same. You're, you're, when, when there's that much at stake, you're going to see people get involved um, however they can to, to influence it. So you, you do have to correct the, the, un, the unlimited debt portion of it. You know, I mean, that $3.1 trillion created in, in one year, uh, one fiscal year um, is such an enormous unchecked power that Congress and those who influence it have gained um, over, you know, it, 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 as I've said, you know, the, if you look at acts of government, the reason that I got involved, step back just a second, the reason I got focused on this documentary um, after the last one, the director I made, which is about the city of Detroit, where we're both from, um, was because we focused on the city of Detroit and all these problems that the city had, including greater than counting now 23,000 murders, um, much of which was related to the war on drugs and the fact that it, you know, it just doesn't make sense the way that it was prosecuted. Uh, and persisting, and there's that's one tiny policy, but there's there's so many policies out there that because they, if you had, we wouldn't have invaded the war, we wouldn't have invaded, invaded Iraq in 2003 if there had to be a 10% income tax increase at the same time. If, if Congress had pushed that, if they had had to push that as part of invading Iraq, then the American public wouldn't have bought it. And similarly. Um, Outside of a emergency spending, where I could permit, you know, I could understand some some debt being spent. Um, what Medicare Part D? Um, what the Democrats? I'm sure after the COVID relief package, there's going to be a number of proposals, and they're going to be debt funded. And and the American people are just effectively taken out of the loop and never asked what they believe in. They don't have to affirmatively spend their spend taxes. They never. They're not really in the process. So until they're involved in the process by paying for it they're just you know it's out of sight out of mind and i think that that's a, a, a root of so much of the problems you mentioned also electoral reforms along the way of you know that primaries are closed you know i mean that the primary that the primary process may give us overly radical you know candidates that really don't represent the majority of, of people i think that's a problem and and practically speaking i think that issues like that uh, you know, opening primaries, uh, you know, ending gerrymandering, um, and, you know, things like ranked choice voting are probably more actionable um, near-term wins. And that's where people who, who you know, the, the bigger issue of, say, putting some sort of limit on the government, government debt spending, it's so far away um, from, from where we're at that I think that to, to, to get some, you know, to, to work with more people, to, Achievable reforms are smaller level electoral reforms, and that's the place to focus to try and improve the representatives. Um, and then gradually, you know, you build up and you and you get to where you need to go. Um, and I I think that there can be improvements in campaign finance, and there can be reforms in in lobbying um, as well uh, to those processes. I don't know how actionable they are, but I think that those smaller scale areas are are where you have you can't just you know say that I'm not, I'm going to focus on the root of the problem, even if I can't get anything done about it and, and just beat my drum uh, that nobody's listening to. You can do that, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change anything. So that, that um, to, to get to the point, you're, you're, you're correct in what you're saying about the root of it and just question how you get there. Right. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we find, those of us who work on budgetary policy is that, um, there are, there's a belief, I think, that uh, it's really just a matter of crafting the right rule to solve the problem so that, you know, if we had the perfect, perfect budget rules uh, in place, um, you know, whether constitutional or statutory or whatever, um, we would end up getting outcomes that are what, what we may want to see those outcomes to be. Um, and, you know, I, my perspective on this is that I think rules are very important. I think they're, they're, it's, it's important to have sort of um, you know, to, to design them in, a, in a, a way that is most conducive to ensuring that the actors within the system um, 
you know, uh, are, are sort of operating under a framework that it's fair. But I also think that it is somewhat overstated that just changing those rules separate from having actors in the system who really care about these outcomes or better outcomes, you know, you, you can't, you, you, it's, it, I think it's a, a myth that you can just craft the right rules and you're going to get, you're going to get what you want. And I wonder, I wonder if that's true in, in this context as well, you know, to what degree do you think that, um, you know, we're trying to treat these issues through, again, through, I guess, addressing the symptoms. I mean, I think that, you know, I sort of view it in, in the budgetary context, you know, rules as a necessary but not sufficient condition. And I wonder, you know, you know, when you talk about things like, um, you know, lobbying, or um, we talk about some of these electoral reforms, or, you know, money within the system, whatever it might be that, that we sort of talk about, um, to what degree is that all secondary? to, I mean, other factors that, that we haven't talked about, like having citizens who care about seeing changed outcomes, for example. Yeah, um, well, so, so yeah. yeah, yeah, and and talking a little bit about how the, how the film got made the way it did might help to address that, because when I started, um, I was very focused. I was, there were groups that I found out there that were pushing the Article five, you know, what I mean, like path to a balanced budget that are pitch, pictured in the film, and and I do think that, you know, debt, the issue of unlimited debt spending, as we've already discussed, you know, quite a bit, um, is a very enormous issue. Um, so I started, I followed those groups, got to meet and know um, the the leading people from them. And I found that they were obsessively focused on uh, just trying to somehow get an amendment into the constitution that, that, that if they just were able to just pop in an amendment that, you know, it, and, and, and using the article five process where, because you have 20 at the time, I think it was 28 or 29 states when I was, you know, getting involved that they had, that had passed a resolution calling for the convention. So, they were just trying to scheme out how can we get you know uh, another five states if we can just get five more states on the quick we can do this convention and then we can just we'll, we'll write up the rules we covered the meeting in phoenix that they held where they tried to write up the draft rules that would govern the convention were it to be called so it wouldn't run away or be any sort of problem and if we can just get that organized and then just kind of find those small groups of legislatures that we need uh, legislators and the aides to to just get this thing through that we can just we'll get that in place and then that's going to stop us from turning into Venezuela and and that was the attitude um, of these leading these people leading these groups who are pretty small and very grassroots um, groups so far as I've seen and and I one of the reasons I got involved in film was because I just said well that's that's never going to happen you're not going to uh, even if you could just magically tomorrow put into the constitution a amendment that put in some some fiscal restraint in place it would just be ignored or you know they, they would bypass it uh, you know through declaring an emergency um, until there was enough public support out there to prevent them from doing that so people myopically fo focusing on an amendment as opposed to what I see as needing to happen, which is that popular movement uh, needing to build up to the point where, uh, you know, legislators, you know, democratic legislators really have to answer um, for creating $2 trillion to fund the Green New Deal. And that, and that you know, wh why are you doing it this way? Until, until there's enough people that are asking that question and, and just and, and recognize that not paying for what government is spending is a problem, then it's going to continue. So the film is very targeted. It's, it's an educational film. It's not Michael Moore trying to, you know, get a gun law passed, you know, I mean, tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's trying to get high school, college, you know, act, people that are more inclined to these things to see uh, what is, I think, a strategy and a pathway to getting um, these bigger reforms done, which I do believe is working on finding 
working on smaller reforms, working at a more local and state level on smaller reforms so that you get used to that. And then when there is the right moment to, to take on the bigger reforms, um, you know, you've had the conversations, you've built the relationships and the bridges to, um, you know, help to get your, you know, lefty friend who um, supports the Green New Deal to understand that, you know, funding it strictly through debt is, you know, assuredly going to lead to unfair, inequitable outcomes and an unsustainable um, long-term, um, you know, result. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I, my view is that it's generally a t t two sides of the coin that you, and you need to have both, you know, you need to have the, you need to think about how to craft good policy and, but there's also that there needs to be that demand for good policy as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, I think that's right. I, um, you know, one of the other topics that you touched on in the, in the film is, uh, you know, this idea of polarization, and, and maybe it's not necessarily polarization per se, but, um, you know, I believe uh, someone refers to it as the, uh, the, the duopoly and sort of the, the distinction that, um, you know, many Americans are more independent or more moderate in their beliefs but that in the political system, uh, we end up kind of increasingly having, you know, people on both sides of, uh, of uh, you know, sort of both extremes and not as much in the middle. And we've seen the two major parties, I think, sort in a way where we have, uh, you know, sort based on ideology, which wasn't necessarily the case before, you know, we tended to have more, you know, regional interests, for example. So, um, you know, keeping up on this theme of whether this is a symptom of, of a bigger problem, or if you think that this is, a, you know, a root cause, you know, where do you sort of put, um, you know, polarization and kind of the existing party structure, I guess? Uh, yeah, I, I think the polarization is, is largely manufactured by the party structure. What, what you have, you have a lot of people who are very angry and upset um, because things are broken. You know, you, you hate the way that Congress operates. Um, you 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 see something like, you know, your your medical costs going up three times in twenty years, and you say, what the hell, you know? And you and you're pissed off about it. You know, you've got medical bankruptcies, um, any number of issues where you just look into the system, you say this isn't how it should work. It should be unfair. So you got a lot of people upset about that. But the reason that it becomes a left right conversation is because, you know that's the way that the parties would rather it because it's easier to be opposed to, you know, it, it's easier to paint the other side as evil and, and be the op, you know, and, and be the only alternative to evil than it is to try and get your constituents to have a nuanced understanding of why you have to take this range of stances that you have to take. Um, so they've just taken the easy option over decades and, and the, um, if what we didn't get to cover in the film, which I wanted to, but it, we just didn't have enough time, it's already dense as it is, uh, but, but we didn't get to cover was just the degree to which um, the money that's being raised in political campaigns is largely, you know, that the rule of thumb figure right here is 75% of what money is raised in a political campaign goes into media and communications in some form. You know, you're, you're, you're not just ads, uh, certainly there's plenty of ads, but you're trying to influence the editorials. You're trying to um, get favorable coverage by hiring a communications person that used to work for news bureaus so that you can become the story or the story becomes what you want it. And, and when you really, so in getting more involved in making this film, I saw that process working more and more and more and more areas where I just saw how the new, you know, you. In DC, you see it a lot where you have these 501c3s, uh, tons of 501c3s out there who are just putting out their position papers. They're going to um, the journalist to say, hey, I wrote this piece. You know, they, had, they formed a relationship with the journalist that they say, hey, look, I wrote this piece. You can write, you know, I mean, it makes it easy to write an article if somebody does all the research for you and then puts it in front of you and, you know, at a time where it's topical. And, and there, so there's all these um, politically funded, uh, you know, communications where what most people are getting is, is just a ton of spin. And that's not to say it in a conspiratorial way, uh, but they're, they're getting so much spin. And, and that's been the case for a long time, but, but it's the growth in the funding in the political system that's happening, the growth of the spending in political campaigns is making that 
conversation more and more polarized. You're getting more and more um, of a polarized discussion because that that's what the fund the ads buy. You know, you can just you can make a nasty ad about a candidate under some super PAC's name, put it out one week before the elections, and maybe that gets you the five thousand you know votes that you needed um, to succeed. And you know, there's there's no answering for it. So I think that the not to, I don't want to say polarization is completely manufactured. People have changed their patterns. People, you know, more liberal people live in cities, and more conservative people tend to live outside of them, and that's increased you know over the years. Uh, so there's some self sorting. But at the same time, I think that it's, it's just easier on the parties. There's, a, you know, it, and I think most people, most people see that. So you, you talked about kind of the incentives of the parties, um, you know, from the standpoint of solutions to this issue. Uh, I mean, one of the ideas that I think has been growing in, in uh, attention is this, the notion of ranked choice voting. Uh, you know, we saw, uh, obviously it fell in Massachusetts, but we saw it pass in Alaska, which is now, I believe, the second state after Maine. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, there are obviously efforts to increase choices or provide, I think, uh, maybe a better way of thinking about it is, you know, competitive pressure to the two existing parties um, by by creating these alternative structures. I mean, the, the top two primary structure in California is another example of, of, of an attempt to do this. And so um, I'm curious as to your thoughts about, about ranked choice voting specifically, and, and maybe, you know, just other sort of voting reforms in that regard. Do you think that these are part of the solution? Do you think that they're too heavy of a lift? What sort of, you know, where do you kind of fall on, on that question? No, ranked choice voting, I mean, it's been pushed for a while now for, I mean, for decades, you know, Rob Ritchie and Fair Vote and, you know, the, the movement for it's been been building and, and it's, I think now it's reaching, it's hitting its stride. And, you know, I work on a, a there's a group in Michigan called Rank Am I Vote that I support and, you know, work with on trying to get ranked uh, voting is, you know, uh, on the ballot. And, but, uh, Unfortunately, I mean, I, we're, I'm working on getting them to reform it, but they, they are not applying it to the primary process. And that's one sticking point I have with ranked choice voting is it, any form of it's good. So I'll support it being done in the general election. But if you don't apply it in the primary system, then you've already, self, you've already narrowed down uh, the choices so much that, that it's gonna be less effective. So I, I think that it is, it's clearly, you know, between New York, Maine, um, and I don't, was it Alaska that they, they pass recently? Yes, Alaska is the most recent state, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so yes, it's, it's definitely growing, and I think that uh, it, it definitely does offer a good alternative. I would like it to be seen, done in the primary stage and mm -hmm. not in the general uh, stage. I, I, I'm, you know, the, the type of reforms that I would like to see are, are I mean, there, there's a range. I, I personally, I don't, it's not going to happen, but I don't like seeing party names on the ballot. I don't like I don't like straight ticket voting. That was something that I helped to kind of get repealed in Michigan, um, and then it was put back on through a legal uh, challenge. Uh, but I don't like straight ticket voting. I don't like to see names on the ballot. I wish that party names weren't anywhere on the ballot, so we did not know, and we actually had to know something about that candidate to vote for them. Um, there's so there's a variety of electoral reforms that I would support, but ranked choice voting is very popular right now, and I think it's a good one to get on board with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what would be at the top of your list, I guess? I mean, we've, we've talked about a number of issues that are all kind of related. One is the sort of, um, you know, the spending and debt enabling of, of you know, corruption in the system. The second is, you know, the, the nature of, of lobbying and how it can impact this process in, in many ways, in good ways, uh, of course, and in many ways, in bad ways, and how we kind of deal with that. And then, um, and then now we're talking a little bit about some of the electoral issues that, that come into play here. You know, I wonder if you could, um, you know, if you were a benevolent dictator for the day and you could go and implement that one reform that you think might be the most substantive, might not solve everything, but, you know, what do you, what do you see as the solution? What's the thing that you might, uh, you might do that you think could be most impactful at addressing, you know, one or, or maybe multiple of these kind of different, uh, you know, spheres? Yeah, well, the, you know, the, the dream reform, which, um, I probably wouldn't put in because I think that the groundwork's not there, but the dream reform is to put in some sort of fiscal restraint on Congress to not allow for limit 
unlimited debt. There just has to be some limit that's put in place. And I'm not saying an annually balanced budget that they have to annually balance the budget, but some sort of, you know, I mean, debt restraint. You know, I, I think I know that Sweden and Switzerland are much smaller countries, but they both have that. And, and it's, it's just a sensible uh, measure. And I think that that is the, the one thing that would make the government most accountable um, to the people would be if they really had to, you know, again, get their funding from them. And it would also help to decrease the size and inefficiency of the government because um, it, it is, people just don't know what's going on. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, I didn't have a chance to touch on the film because it wasn't about, um, it wasn't as debt focused as I started, but if, you know, we have our, the Federal Reserve is so focused on inflation and the cost of um, everyday goods, you know, not rising by a certain percentage, ignoring totally that, you know, industrial processes make things more efficient, you know, all the time. Our, the company I work at is, is able to produce more, cheaper, faster, a little bit more every year. So prices really should should be going down on, on a lot of articles. And what we've seen, you know, the, the growth of government, you know, I mean, has been, while it seems like because inflation is at two or 3% um, that, you know, they're doing a great job managing the financial system, it, it ignores that the prices should be completely different. I mean, housing prices, education, healthcare, because they're all desired commodities have, have gone up severely um, in the last 20 or 30 years with all this money kind of flowing in the way that it is. Uh, and, and it's causing, it, it, it furthers the wealth gap um, and, and it kind of uh, cements it in, in, in place to an extent. So I think that the, and the degree to which debt, you know, allows for things like that is, is that's, so that's the major, if I could put something to place, that would be it. I don't think that, I mean, in the near term, that's not um, practical. So in the immediate, uh, if I, if I just had the ability to do, you know, one smaller uh, reform to improve things, it probably would be something in the order of getting, you know, I mean, it, it, it would be eliminating, um, again, if it, for some reason I'm fixated on getting party names off ballots because I just find that that makes, um, you know, again, it, they, this is the, parties, the parties have cemented themselves into such a position. If, if rank, let's just say ranked choice voting across the board for, for any um, federal or state legislative or, you know, executive um, appointment or, you know, judges to some extent. I wouldn't say across the board because there's probably certain positions where it's just impractical to do, but I'd say ranked choice voting across the board starting in the primary stage would probably be a pretty darn good uh, reform and getting us some sensible, you know, moderate, practical legislators. Mm -hmm. I want to throw one other idea out there as well, which is just because it's something that that you know we have worked on at R Street and the governance program specifically has worked on a lot, um, and that's the idea of of increasing congressional capacity. That you know, I think there's a strong argument to be made that over time we've seen you know the balance between the legislative and executive branches become. Uh, far more tilted in the direction of of the executive and Congress, you know, whether you see that as Congress abdicating its responsibilities or you see it as the executive, you know, taking those responsibilities over time, um, you know, we've kind of had uh, many more federal responsibilities to come under the purview of the executive branch, which is arguably less accountable in the sense that you don't have uh, the same level of accountability to the voters that you do with members of the legislature. And so, um, you know, I'm curious to get your take on that about the degree to which, um, you know, you think that, that I, I mean, it, it's kind of this, this, this interesting paradox in a sense, because I think we would both acknowledge that, you know, increasingly we've had, you know, fewer and fewer in Congress who have really been interested in the business of legislating and kind of being, um, you know, being workhorses rather than show horses. Uh, but you could argue that part of the reason for that is because this this balance has been interrupted or, or has been changed over time. And so, you know, I wonder if you think that that might be something that, um, uh, you know, it, it may not be the only answer, of course, but at least something that would be a, a positive, positive change. You're saying increasing the number of legislators in 
Congress? It, it could be that. I wasn't even necessarily thinking about that, but it, it could even just be, you know, uh, either increasing, it, it could be increasing resources for Congress. It could be, you know, increasing the, basically allowing allowing Congress to um, play a bigger role in a sense. And then whether that's a, from a resource standpoint, or which of course, you know, uh, appropriations for the legislative branch are, are trivial in the context of the broader federal government. Federal government, but um, you know, it, it could be it could be changes to the structure of of the um, of the legislature. But I'm you know I'm I'm curious to get your thoughts on on what sort of reforms or what your thoughts are in, in, with respect to maybe Congress specifically. Yeah, yeah, that that makes. I mean, I I do I do believe that, as I said, you know, um, disallowing. Members of Congress to fund right now, it, empowering Congress as opposed to removing Congress. I believe that is um, important. I do think that if you, as we show in the film, and I'm sure that you know viewers of this who are in D.C. have very direct experience, uh, as do I have many friends who worked on the Hill. Um, to have at the median age of the Hill staffer is 25 years old, I believe. Um, their median salary is thirty thousand dollars, and they've got a few years of experience, you know, under their belt uh, in, in what they're working on. That, that, and there's about I think there's somewhere around six thousand staffers in in DC. Now, when you compare that to you know the lobbyists out there, of which the numbers are between ten thousand and ninety thousand in the estimates that I've that I've seen, which I think it's sixty thousand, you know, actual lobbyists, people that would really qualify as lobbyists is what um, I wouldn't say a consensus, but that's what the Sunlight Foundation and somebody else, that's what the number they kind of settle on is just probably more accurate. Um, and those people are so much better paid, so much more experienced to to have all of that power outside of the government um, naturally just uh, I mean how it, it that doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? If, if you want the, the people in Congress to be in charge, then beyond just having votes, they need to have the resources under their uh, control to actually write the legislation. You know, if you have to go to, you know, the experienced former legislature who now receives $1.5 million and works on, you know, K Street or whatever street um, to, to write that bill for you, then you have, you know, taken that process out of the scrutiny, you know, and, and accountability that you have, that our government's supposed to have. So I do think you need to have greater resources. I've never been a big fan of, of term limits um, because I don't, you know, again, that's the hot button issue, uh, but um, the, I, I, I thought, well, it does cycle out um, legislatures and does, there are positives to it. It also is one more thing that will make um, legislatures totally beholden to a structure that's outside of the government. Um, so I wouldn't support it until those structures are within um, the government. My, uh, so I, I, I agree with you, the legislature certainly needs to be more empowered to, you know, how, how that would work as I'm, I'm not an expert on, but I trust some people at our street are. <laughs> it's true, I, and I think the uh, you know we've we've been very involved with the select committee on modernization, for example, which has um, you know proposed a lot of ideas, some small, some big, that I think could be uh, you know uh, move the pendulum back, perhaps in the direction that it that it needs to be. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I thought I I uh, we could close maybe by talking a little bit about. Um, where we are currently in the in the you know, political you know we've, we, in the, in the our political state of being so to speak um, we have um, you know a new president we have a new Congress and so um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on you know where are you optimistic uh, or maybe not optimistic at all but uh, you know and where do you think the opportunities might be in the next say two to four years to advance some of these things. And I guess you could answer that in a number of different ways. You could certainly talk about it in the federal context, but uh, you know, perhaps there's the, the better opportunities are in the States. Uh, you know, I have my own thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm curious to hear where, where, where you are. Well, I'm uh, a lowly uh, vice president of operations at a plastics company in Detroit area. So I, to talk about the opportunities in Washington is way above, you know, way, way beyond me. And you all, you all know, um, that better. I, I personally am not very optimistic because I haven't seen any anything that 
I mean, there, there's small reforms. I mean, it, again, let's talk, to talk about HR1 very briefly. Um, there's probably 20 to 40% of those reforms that I would actually support. Now, whether the Democratic Party is going to allow the more popular um, reforms to get out of one giant bill and, and just be passed. And I, I think this kind of is like ranked choice voting, where it's just like, why is it that we're voting on, you know, I mean, like a 80 measure package as opposed to, you know, just, just taking those measures that might actually have popular support and, and you know, or, or be supportive and, and just voting on that. Why, why don't we do it that way? Why is it? So we'll, if, if the Democrats um, will, you know, exercise power differently, I mean, there might be some hope there. I don't, I don't really see it. Um, and I don't see, uh, I personally am fairly pessimistic about um, the opportunities for major reform. There's opportunity, a lot of opportunities for smaller reforms that, that you, you all at R Street or in you know, Washington need to focus on to you know, keep things running uh, and, and, and that really do matter uh, that I from you know, a thousand miles away uh, just just blow off as you know, kind of well. It's not really make any difference, but yeah, I know it does. It does make a difference. So I'm sure that there's a lot of opportunities there. I think that in in the world that I occupy, the uh, the opportunities are at the state and local level, and they are largely um, about making you know our own uh, the, the local communities more informed on these subjects. You know, Detroit's had a real uh, turnaround in you know, being a, a municipality that was governed for 40 years by kind of a, uh, a very racially polarized, uh, politically polarized um, system. And, you know, post bankruptcy, and even a bit before the bankruptcy, they really realized, okay, well, we have to do things differently. And, and so, so putting things like fiscal restraints in place on the government here uh, is something we can do and, and, and building uh, coalitions to get more done in Michigan is more possible now. So that's where I focus, but that's not to say that there's not uh, great opportunities in Washington. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, a little from column A, a little from column B is really what we need. You know, it's, um, it's, uh, that's my view that there, there are reforms at all levels of the government. And I think it's important not to focus exclusively on federal reforms, but to think about the implications in the states. You know, we do this all the time on, you know, criminal justice issues, for example, uh, and, and like our electoral work. Um, but I think there is also a lot of opportunity for, uh, you know, we, we need to, everything does to some degree begin at the top. And so it's important to, uh, to, to work very hard at the, at the federal level. Um, maybe not quite the most optimistic way to end as we, as we could have, but I think, um, I do think there are, there are opportunities and a, a lot of our work is, you know, trying to um, identify where those opportunities exist and, and, um, and hopefully advance them. And I, you know, anytime I suppose there's a new administration and a new, uh, a new Congress, you know, you want to have some level of optimism. And so uh, I will, I will maintain that, I suppose, until proven otherwise, but mm -hmm. Andrew, I want to thank you so much for, for being with us here today. I will um, put the link one more time for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, uh, Unrepresented. It's a fantastic movie um, and it will be on, on PBS. So if you don't get to watch it now, you'll be able to see it uh, uh, hopefully in the coming month on, on your local PBS affiliate, but I very much encourage you to watch it. And, uh, you know, I guess one last housekeeping note, um, we, uh, we will actually, since we've talked a little bit about HR1, we will have uh, uh, a primer talking about our street's perspective on these issues coming out in the next few weeks. And so, um, we, you know, that will be something that uh, I'm sure you all will see. And uh, I think it's a, uh, obviously there are, as you said, there, there are some things that are good, a whole lot more, I think, that, that would be considered bad from my perspective, but uh, um, but we'll sort of present that in a, in a balanced way. So um, thank you again, Andrew. Thank you to everyone for attending. And uh, look forward to talking with you all next month. Have a good one. Thank you very much, everyone.